as we begin, uh, there are a lot of things I would like to say about one of your personal comments, but I suspect I'm going to be really pushed for time, so I will just say again how honored I am to be invited to participate in this venue. And, um, and as I said in my opening remarks, if my counsel has conflicted with that of any of the other instructors, please forget mine and follow theirs. In this lecture, we will be concerned with the pastor's vision and purpose regarding the church collectively as a body. There is, among some in the Reformed community, an intensified interest in the body life of the church. And there are those who appear to advocate a restructuring of the church as we have known it. And at least with a few, the idea appears to be to make churches smaller and more intimate, resembling families more than congregations. And we are told that this will result in closer, more intimate, and more productive relationships among the people of God, a greater sense of community, more accelerated personal growth, and comfort for the people of God. A biblical practice of body life is indeed crucial to the church being and functioning as Christ designed and purposed that it would function. However, I am not convinced that we are correctly defining what the church ought to be or the role that body life ought to play in the church, in bringing the church toward its objective. Is body life an end to itself so that when we have a achieved a really close and intimate relationship among the people of God, we have attained our goal. Is body life an end to itself, essentially? Or is body life one means, one means to a much larger and greater end? The theme of this lecture is the pastor with the army of the Lord. The pastor with the army of the Lord. And this theme is predicated upon the following proposition. The church ought to be an army on the offensive. The church ought to be an army on the offensive. When our Lord promised to make his disciples fishers of men and declared his intention to build his church against which the gates of hell would not prevail. And when he commanded the church as represented by the apostles to go among the nations making disciples, in all of this, Christ was conveying a picture of aggressiveness aggressiveness. Now I'm using the word aggressive in the sense of being vigorously energetic, using initiative and forcefulness for the accomplishment of a defined objective. I am saying that the church of Jesus Christ ought to be on the offensive in the sense of being vigorously energetic and aggressive toward the accomplishment of a well-defined objective. Let me illustrate a little bit of what I mean by aggressiveness. 
I am a college football fan. I pull for a school that is abysmal in football. It's one of the two smallest schools among the major football universities. I have been known um, to become intensely frustrated with my favorite team over what I consider an overly conservative game plan. And I, I'm a season ticket holder, so I've, I've seen a lot of games. And, and the team usually opens games with a very imaginative mixture of plays, trying to catch the opposition off guard and attempting to take the game by the throat. And I've seen it work against Florida State, sorry, against Virginia Tech, even against Notre Dame. It was amazing. However, once they took the lead, the coaching staff habitually reverted to a very conservative game plan, trying to protect the lead instead of staying aggressive, endeavoring to increase the lead. If you lose, you're going to lose being vigorously energetic and trying daring moves to switch the sport. I once heard Johnny Miller, the famous professional golfer of another day, ask how he held on to the lead, how he approached the final round of a tournament if he started the final round in the lead. And if you follow PGA golf, you know one of the most difficult things in sport is to finish a tournament, win a tournament, if you start the final round with the lead. Tendency is to get very conservative and somebody comes from the back and well, Johnny Miller said, if I start the day with a four-stroke lead, I try to get it to a seven-stroke lead. I don't try to protect. I try to be aggressive. Well, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Obviously, we're speaking of something of infinitely greater importance than any sport or any other human endeavor. But here's my point. The local church ought to have the clearly defined objective of filling the world with the truth of Jesus Christ and doing so in such a way that more and more people are being added continually to the ranks of Christ worshipers. The church, any church, my church, your church, ought to have the clearly defined objective of filling the world with the truth of Christ and doing so in such a way as to solicit more and more new people to join the ranks of Christ worshipers. And pastors are especially responsible for this vision. Having this vision, maintaining this vision, and leading the church in this well-defined direction. Now there are a myriad of things to distract us and to hinder us and to discourage us from sustaining an aggressive posture of outreach and evangelism. It's my contention that this is very much at the heart of what the church is and what it's about, to be aggressive in evangelism. Now I want to examine a few passages which I believe to be supportive of my proposition. Again, the proposition is that the church ought to be an army on the offensive. Let me put it in a different way, the church ought to be imperialistic, not in a theonomic sense, but in a gracious gospel sense. 
First, let's give fresh thought to a few passages in the book of Acts. And we're not going to look at any text that you haven't seen, I hope. (laughs) I can't imagine that that would be true. And I'm going to spend a lot of time reading text. And I normally don't do that, but somehow I think that perhaps that would be useful. The first passage is found in Acts chapter 4. Verses 18 through 21. And if you'll just take a minute and glance, you'll see the context. A miracle has happened. Jerusalem is in an uproar. People are being converted. Jews are not happy. And so the Sanhedrin called Peter and John and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when their companions heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, to do whatever your hand and purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. And notice the response given by Peter and John to the chief priests and rulers of Israel, the ecclesiastical authority that forbade them to publicly preach or teach in the name of Christ. Verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. These men were aware of a divinely authored compulsion behind what they were doing. It was something God required. It it was a non-elective. Now perhaps we're inclined to say that that was because they were apostles. It was peculiar to their office as apostles. But it could be that they were referring to the mandate that was given to the church and not just to the apostle. Look at verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. There was a compulsion by divine fiat. But there was also a compulsion born out of holy enthusiasm arising from the experience of gospel reality. Have we experienced gospel reality? Now, not in the way they did. We haven't touched the incarnate Savior. We were not there when he was crucified. We haven't seen his risen body, but the reality that saved them has saved us. And by faith, we have apprehended that reality. And by grace, that that reality has apprehended us. 
So should there not be an enthusiasm over what we have experienced? An enthusiasm that we purposefully keep alive. I think that is part of the pastor's responsibility. Stir up the people of God in the things, the realities that they have experienced in Christ. Labor to keep those realities fresh and vibrant and energizing. Now, to whom did Peter and John report their experience with the Sanhedrin? text says they came back to their own. They came back to their own companions. Who were they? Did they come back to the other apostles? Or did they come back to the church or a, represent, a representation of the church? If it was the church to which they reported, it was the church that prayed for boldness in proclamation. And it was the church that prayed for miraculous attestations of the gospel. And it was the church that was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was the church that spoke the word of God with great boldness. And even if the apostles were at that time the exclusive public spokesman, it seems evident that the entire church understood that they were to be aggressive. And they were not intimidated by the threats. And their enthusiasm and vision was not diminished. They rejoiced in what was happening, even the threats. And they pleaded with God that they would have courage and boldness to continue noising the gospel. There was no suggestion of a fortress mentality. If anyone dared to say, well, guys, man, maybe we better rethink this. I mean, these guys were angry. I mean, they were really angry. They could do bad things to us. Maybe we, maybe we better roll it back a notch or two. If anyone said that, there was no hint of it. The church was aware that it had been called to do something aggressively. Well, the next installment of the saga is found in chapter 5, at least the part that I want to reference. Chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The Holy Spirit didn't say, or the angel didn't say, Guys, I'm sorry. Man, this has been hard. I... I Really, why don't you just come apart for a while? Nurse your wounds. We'll send somebody else. Can there be any question but that at least, at least, at least at this time, God wanted his church to be aggressive? Go stand in the temple, speak to the people all the words of this life. I know, I know you're in jail. And if it hadn't been for me, you'd still be in jail. I don't want you hiding. There's no time to pull up stakes and move out of town. I want you to go back in the public arena, and I want you to speak loudly, clearly. A bit later, note the accusation brought against the apostles in verse 27. And when they had apprehended them again, they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly 
command you not to teach in this name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Go down to verse 40. And the Sanhedrin agreed with Gamaliel. And when they had called, remember the Sanhedrin wanted to put them to death and shut them up. He gave them much wiser counsel. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily, in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now I suspect that someone argued that these texts, the texts that we've been reading are simply about the work of the apostles, not the work of the church. This was all temporary. My contention is that this is paradigmatic for the church. I think that this, while there were exceptional dimensions to it, obviously, the supernatural, there were were things about that particular period that were exceptional, But the mandate, the mandate they were following was a mandate that Christ gave when he ascended on high. It was a mandate to the church, not just to the apostles. The apostles were the pillars of the church, representatives of the church, but the mandate is to the church. The following excerpts make clear that the church was active in carrying out this charge apart from the apostles. Look at Acts chapter 6. Acts 6 verse 7. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests, that's amazing. I wish I, wish I had known what that looked like. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You know, the Bible is written in the same ink, and it's, it's not, parts of it aren't in bold, and we just read this. A great many of the priests were obedient. I mean, think about that. Think what that represents. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, whether whether or not it's correct to view Stephen as a member of the first diaconate, what is clear, he was not an apostle. Stephen was not an apostle, and yet he was bold and he was courageous with the gospel. And there was an irresistible aura to him, which is the Spirit of God working through him. Go over to Acts chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against Stephen the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching, gospeling the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. What was scattered abroad? A substantial portion of the church minus the apostles. And so we must understand that there were ordinary church members, 
people not officially recognized as possessing a Holy Spirit-endowed aptitude for teaching that went everywhere gospeling the Word. They were aggressively proclaiming God's Word of good news in Christ. It may have been a bit chaotic. They were forced to go abroad by persecution. Probably wasn't well-ordered, probably wasn't systematic. But there was something those people understood they ought to be doing. They were suffering for the gospel. So they ought to be at the gospel. And that's what they did. They gospeled the word of God. The early chapters of Acts detailed the church working out the Great Commission with purpose and enthusiasm. Maybe I missed something, but that's, that's what I see. I see the early church doing what Jesus commanded them to do. And I, I, I think they were full of vim and vigor. Now, the question that I think we must answer is this. What in Scripture indicates that the church ought to back away from this kind of deliberate zeal? What is there in the Bible that indicates that that kind of a purposeful aggressiveness in evangelism was for that people only, not for us. Beloved, the question is not, should the church do other things? That's not the question. The church was doing other things during this explosion of the gospel. They were taking care of benevolence. They were selling all their property so that people wouldn't go hungry. And church discipline was taking place. The church was doing other things. But the church was dominated by one thing. Evangelism. The question is not, does the church have many responsibilities? church has many responsibilities. But the question is, should anything be more defining of any congregation's life and purpose than spreading abroad the fame of Jesus Christ and endeavoring to persuade the world to worship Him? Should anything be more defining? It doesn't mean should we be careless about uh, church structure? Should we be careless about worship and how we do? Of course not. But should anything be more defining in the psyche of the church, in the way the church thinks about itself? How should the church identify itself? What are we about? Well, we meet three times a week. That's what we're about. We fix dinner for people who are sick. Those are good things. I don't deny that. We're helping each other get to heaven. That's part of what the church is about. Help each other get to heaven. But is that the defining quality of the church? You say, well, you can prove anything from Acts. (laughs) Well, let's go to the epistles. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Paul writes, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we don't need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols 
to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And I think Paul was giving the essence of what they were saying to people. That, that's a word that was being sounded forth. It, it was a word about the saving efficacy of Christ and the power of the gospel to break bonds and set people free. Now, Paul was only in Thessalonica for a very brief period of time. And yet, that fledgling church seemed to have embraced the honor of representing Christ and the honor of publishing their faith far and wide. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, and it may surprise you that I'm referencing this text and you may dispute my use of it. You're certainly free to do that. I think the book of Ephesians has been building toward this mandate. When Paul says, finally, I don't think he means, oh, by the way, one last thing. I think he is saying, this is what I've been bringing you to. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, pray in all ways, pray in all ways with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. For the greater part of my life, I have viewed this passage as providing counsel to the church under attack as opposed to seeing this counsel for the church which is on the attack. And I really think that's what this text is about. I've come to think that it is wrong to envision the church as a cloistered community, minding its own business, trying simply to learn its manuscripts, raise its children, and be at peace with the world. I don't think that's why Paul gave this direction. There's a big bad devil out there and he's going to try to get you so you just be on the defensive. I don't think that's what Paul is saying. I think Paul is calling the church to be aggressive. Know what you're going up against. Know how to wear the spiritual armament, part of which is a sword and feet that are shod with the preparation of the gospel and go after them. I think it's wrong to think of the church hiding, fearful, perplexed, 
What can we do in this ruined culture? Hold on till Jesus comes and hope we don't lose anyone. I actually heard a man say that. I heard a pastor, an old pastor, say, I'm not trying to gain anymore. I'm just trying to hold on to what we've got. <laughs> Let me say I also think it's wrong to think of the church as an angry mob attacking modern culture with commands and accusations and threats and all sorts of carnal weapons. I think that's wrong, too. And I know we wouldn't advocate Westboro Baptist Church. I understand they're going, they picketed um, Paterno's funeral. Those people are an embarrassment to the gospel. Now, I, I, I'm not thinking about a church that is trying to take down culture by means of the law. I think it is best to see the church as dispensing itself into the world as gentle, loving, holy, competent members of society. Thinking of God's people living open, accessible, responsible lives. Thinking of them exemplifying what it means to be loving spouses, diligent parents, diligent workmen, diligent citizens, and loving neighbors. And in everything they do, displaying the gentleness and kindness of Jesus Christ. And yet, doing all things, seeking to be diligent, workmen, diligent citizens, loving parents, but doing all of this with gospel intentions. Laboring to build credibility and relationships for the explicit purpose of bringing the gospel to those who are shackled by sin. Not simply trying to build a good reputation for Christianity, but seeking to show the excellency of holiness and true piety that Jesus Christ produces, so through that we might actually reach people who are in bonds. I don't think that happens accidentally. I think the church has to purpose to do that. And I think we have to be prepared to do battle. Not with unconverted people. At times it looks like we're fighting against people. But as Paul says, no, our war is not with flesh and blood. Our war is with the spiritual powers that have enslaved those people. The wicked thought patterns, philosophies, habits that enslave them. It is this gospel-oriented, aggressive behavior. That's what is assumed in the Great Commission. That's what was exemplified by the church in Acts. It involves the church in a great spiritual combat, not defensively, but on the offense driving back the gates of hell, believing that in Christ we are more than conquerors. Let me just ask, could it be that in verses 18 through 20, could it be that Paul is saying, he's, he's told them to pray, to pray for all the saints, could it be, in verses 18 through 20, Paul is saying, and please pray for me the same way you pray for yourselves. Namely, that even here in prison, I would also open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Could it be that Paul is saying, I know this is how you're praying, that all of you would be bold, 
and forthright in speaking the gospel. Now, pray for me in the same way that even here in prison, I would do what you are praying for the grace to do. Could it be? I hope you're familiar with a lot of modern hymns, and particularly with the Getty Townsend hymn, O Church Arise. I think, of course, I'm pretty illiterate when it comes to music, but I, I think it's a masterpiece. And the first, the first two stanzas capture what I'm trying to say out of this text. Listen, listen to these words. O church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love reaching out reaching out to those in darkness. Now this second stanza, I think, is a masterpiece. Our call, our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure, and Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. I love that picture. The church has been endowed with strength, and we have armor. Now put it on and get to war. The last piece of biblical evidence to which I'll point is simply the analogy of the body. You're aware that the church is likened to the body. It's called the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22, 23, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Why did God create human beings with bodies as well as with souls? He created us with bodies so we'd be preoccupied with them. How they look, how they feel, even how they function. God gave us bodies so we could perform part of our image bearing of him by doing things. I mean, it's really hard to accomplish anything with just your soul. You want to move that chair and look at it and will it, but it's not going to move very much. But with a body, you actually can go over and move the chair, right? God gave us bodies so we could do things. What is the church called a body? So it could sit around, look at itself, prim itself in the mirror. Aren't we beautiful? I, I, let's take our own pulse, see if we're healthy. I've got a theory. It's the only theory. I can't prove it. I think that the disruptions that Reformed churches have known in their ranks is largely due to the fact that we're sitting around looking at ourselves. <laughs> That's not why we have been made a body. God intends that we should go to work that we should function, that we should move things. That's why the church is a body. That we might take the truth that he has taught us and put it into action, going, doing some heavy lifting. Well, perhaps not to your satisfaction, but to my satisfaction, I prove my proposition. That the church ought to be an army on the offensive for Christ and the gospel. Point number two, God's plan for keeping the church in tip-top condition 
for work and war. You're in Ephesians, I hope. Go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Another extended passage familiar to you. Beginning in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which each part does its share, causes growth in the body for the edifying of itself in love. The body life depicted here, I submit to you, this body life conditions the church to pursue the spiritual integrity that is spelled out in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So that ultimately, the church might be able to engage in the spiritual warfare depicted in the text we just read in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Here, Paul is defining some of the mechanism that Christ has set in place so that the church might strengthen itself and prove itself by the integrity of the practical righteousness defined in chapters 4 through 6, so that at the end the church might be equipped to do the battle that is defined in verses 10 through 20. The public ministry of pastor-teachers supplies the fuel, is a catalyst by which body life takes place. The public ministry alone cannot keep the body in sufficient health or in sufficient condition either to establish a strong witness in the world or to do battle with the powers of darkness. Pastors must aim at equipping the saints with a whole counsel of God, with an understanding of truth, with a knowledge of righteousness required for the saints then to exercise their respective gifts and ministry to one another. The idea is a pastor equips the saints and the saints minister to each other. To what end? That the church might be strong enough to engage lies without being blown off course. To engage the world and all the cunning craftiness of darkness without being harmed. I don't think it's right to think of the church as looking at itself, equipping itself, and then the darkness comes into the church. I think the analogy is always the church goes to the darkness and defeats it. Individual members possess from Christ differing gifts, differing functions, but the picture, I believe, is that each member is active in making the body strong enough to do its work in this world without being injured, without being overcome by insidious temptations. The perspective I'm offering is that aggressive evangelism is the work of the church as a whole. 
not just the pastors. It's a work of the church. And I don't mean by that that each member engages the world in exactly the same way. But that each member contributes to enabling the body to do the work of confronting the world without being weakened. All the members, hopefully defining their own (coughs) gifts and functions, have a view, I'm part of this endeavor to take the gospel to the world. And my part may be this, but what we are doing collectively is penetrating darkness and rescuing captives. And I've got my role to play. I'm really hesitant to to use illustrations from our church, but uh, since 1970, I haven't been a member of another church. (laughs) So it's it's the only church I have hands-on experience, and this hasn't been the history of our church. But in recent times, we have tried, we have tried feebly to to accept the responsibility for taking the gospel to the world, but also to our community. And that's resulted in a number of things, but a couple of them is a ministry explicitly directed to women. And I've spoken of it before. It's called Mom's Coffee Connection. It's been going on for six years. The elders don't do anything except approve the speakers and the subjects. We don't go to the meetings. Women in the church plan the meetings. They set up everything that has to be set up. Child care, often for 70 or 75 children. Volunteers. It meets once a month on Friday mornings. It is, it is met now for about six years. And if I'm not mistaken, every meeting for six years, there have been visitors. And with the exception of maybe one or two, there have been first-time visitors every meeting for six years. Hare Krishna, Mormon, Roman Catholic. Why do they come? Because they're moms? Because they're lonely? because they want fellowship with other moms, they want encouragement, what do they get? The love of Christ, people who really care, instruction in all kinds of topics, and the gospel. Recently, we have begun what we call action, advancing Christ's teaching in our neighborhood. It's a men's group. And the purpose is a little bit more than with a women's group. It is to to nurture greater connectedness among the men. But the ultimate goal is to reach, as we say, our neighborhood with the gospel of Christ. We've had six meetings so far. We've had at least one man who is a professed agnostic come. We've had 50 to 70 in every meeting. My point is, that's not something the elders are doing. The church is doing it. Young men who have a vision for wanting the church to be evangelistic are doing this. Now, the elders are aware, yeah, it was kind of our idea, but they're carrying the ball. It's a church doing evangelism, going to jails, going to rest homes, going into Hispanic neighborhoods, Church is doing that. My final point, the pastor as field commander of Christ's army. Under under Christ, the pastor is assigned the task of equipping the troops, commanding the troops, leading the troops, serving the troops, and the grand enterprise of taking the gospel to the nations. 
Well, how is this multifaceted work executed practically? Well, I don't have time to flush this out in detail. Number one, the pastor must purpose to supply the church with the vision and the energy and the direction to keep it the task. We have to be visionary men. And believe me, that gets harder as years go on. We have to be visionary. And one of the visions we have to have is what a, a remarkable thing the church is. It's an incredible thing that we have seen happen. It's, it's God building this church. And he has put the church together in such a way that there is incredible possibility in the church. And the possibility is not simply that we are the preachers and we're going to do it. It's that by filling the minds of God's people with truth and praying over that truth and equipping them, great things may be done by the people of God who are in love with the gospel. We've got to, we've got to have that vision, and we've got to keep that vision. And the best way to do that is to keep our people freshly aware of the cross of Jesus Christ and what happened, what really happened at that cross and what was accomplished and the implications of a resurrected Savior. The second great task of the pastor is to keep the soldiers well supplied with weaponry, filling their hands with weapons suited to pull down strongholds and cast down arguments. Apologetics, polemics in the right sense of the word, teaching them how to overcome error with truth. Keeping them aware that the battle is not theirs, it's the Lord's. Keeping them praying. What's the most difficult meeting in the life of a church? A prayer meeting. What's the one we're most tempted to give up? Prayer meeting. What's the one meeting we absolutely cannot do without? It's a prayer meeting. Fight to hold on to your prayer meeting. I don't care when you had it. Just make sure you had it. And make sure that the prominent theme of the prayer meeting is gospel success. Yes, pray about those who are sick and those who are dying. Yes, but the thrust of the prayer meeting ought to be for the gospel. Thirdly, the pastor must attend to the casualties of war. He must attend to those who have been wounded in combat, those who have become fearful and disoriented, those who are discouraged, and he has to issue a summons to those who have gone AWOL. Brothers, we must help Christ church see that the reason we exist is not simply to arrive in heaven fat and unscathed and hope we can get to the end and say, I don't have any wounds. Do you have any wounds? We did a good job. We don't have any wounds. Our objective, our objective must be to attack and to drive back the gates of hell and to overcome the powers of darkness with God's light and to capture as many souls for Christ as he will give us. And we ourselves, as redeemed sinners, and that's who we are, our objective should be to come to the end utterly worn out, battle-weary and bloody,
but convinced that we have fought the, the good fight of the faith assigned to us to the very end. It's so easy to do pastoral ministry without an objective except to hope that people like you come in your sermons and keep giving their money. We need, I think, a vision for the reason that the church exists. May God help us.